Lots of opportunity there. Okay, and if we, by doing so, we move America toward energy independence. And moving us toward energy independence is in our national security interest. I can make the case, our money goes from the gas pump to folks like Hugo Chavez, part of it, to part of it to the Saudi Arabian prince right there in the bottom left, okay? And they are funding the madrasas, these schools in Pakistan, that are raising up Taliban fighters. This is not my, some quirky email, that you know, some viral email. This is me being in Pakistan, in Islamabad, being briefed by our top officials. There's a direct connection between American energy independence, or lack of energy independence, and our reliance on foreign oil, which far too often puts our young men and women in harm's way. So I am really determined, I am really determined to move America toward energy independence. And it's a great way for us to, to create jobs right here in Hampton Roads. Now, second, the military. You know, my dad, believe it or not, this is kind of a neat story, I don't always share this, but this is a unique occasion. My father received the call from the island of Oahu when it was bombed on December 7, 1941. And in those early hours, the call from Oahu went to the island of Midway. There was a young Marine there on duty, had never been out of his little town of Slocum, Alabama, and he received this call that Oahu had been bombed. Well, that young Marine was my father, Ike. And he went on, of course, uh, uh, he had some responsibilities that day to wake up the colonel and, and let him know that the Oahu had been bombed, but he did tell the the Marine captain who just called in, he said, Sir, my orders are not to disturb Colonel Shannon because my father didn't know where Oahu was. And uh, the young Marine captain, you could only imagine what he said, Get Colonel Shannon up. Hawaii's been bombed. You know, and Pearl Harbor's been bombed. Then my dad got it and woke up Colonel Shannon. But he went all through the Pacific Islands, uh, Iwo Jima, Saipan, and he is on, or was yesterday, on the island of Iwo Jima again, after I think 66 or 67 years, he went back with one of those honor trips, which is really neat to think that my dad uh, just yesterday was back on the island of Iwo Jima with the memories of 11 other uh, good World War II veterans. So it's a great honor to serve our military. Um, I've held the view all of my life. For those about my generation, I'm 51 years old. For guys like me and, and ladies of our age, Basically, you understood something. If you went in the military and you gave 20 years, what did you get? You got lifetime medical care. Now, there are a few folks who say, well, Scott, that's not really what I understood or what, look, fair enough. But if nothing else, the military did not do a good job in disclosing exactly what you receive when you retire from the military. I hold the view, and I said it just a couple of weeks after I took office, I found myself looking right there at uh, then Secretary of Defense Gates, and I said, Secretary, Mr. Secretary, this is nothing less than a breach of trust with our men and women in uniform for you to just arbitrarily pick a number as to what you're going to now start charging them for TRICARE. And we kind of went at it right there, and, and it's all on the, the House Armed Services hearing tape. You can see it. I've held that view, and I've been a strong advocate on TRICARE you meet your commitments to those men and women who are receiving the benefits, who thought they were going to receive those benefits. And if we want to talk about the young men and women coming in now and giving them a different benefits package, that's a different discussion. But I do believe... Thank you. I feel very strongly about that, even in these acute fiscal times, that we need to honor our commitments. That's how I was raised. I believe that needs to be done. Uh, the second part is this. Um, I believe in strategic dispersal. That's just a, a fancy name for, for saying spreading out our military assets to minimize the risk from uh, either a catastrophic uh, uh, natural disaster or, um, God forbid, a terrorist attack. Who's not for strategic dispersal? Now, that, needs, that kind of decision needs to be made within the context of our overall risk assessment. Where are the risks that are facing our country, and what budget do we have to, to address that risk? I came to the conclusion a long time ago that it did not make sense for us to improve, that it did not make sense for us to improve the, uh, the facilities down in Mayport, Florida, 
to uh, be able to accommodate a nuclear aircraft carrier. So often when I would go to the base and look at where uh, all those birthing uh, areas are for the, the actually the, the piers for our nuclear aircraft carriers, there's not, there's not two there, there's not one there, there's zero. I mean zero carriers because they're underway, maybe they're over the shipyard. Um, and now we have five, when the Enterprise comes home from her final cruise, she'll be decommissioned. Uh, so at, for at least a period of time, we'll, we'll, we'll be down to four. So I opposed that move and, and, and all the funding that they wanted to, to bring to Mayport, Florida and to move a carrier and all the related ships down there. I'm real pleased we won that. I mean, with the, with the delegation, working with Congress and Scott, and Whitman, we made that case at every opportunity, and I was just delighted that the, uh, the senior military secretary, Mavis, uh, CNO Greenert, and others understood and agreed uh, that that was the right thing to do at present. Uh, Got to watch it. They still have some plans, but we'll watch them, and uh, we'll see if they actually circle back around with any efforts to move it. Um, now, this is a, a, a unique picture here. It was a real honor to be in the Oval Office. Uh, uh, here we go. I can use a little pointer over there. There I am on the left. And of course, there's the president. Now, this was completely bipartisan. This was a signing ceremony uh, for uh, turning Fort Monroe into a national monument. And uh, it was a real pleasure. You know, it's the, the, the U.S. Capitol is your house. I have an office there, but it's on. you have loaned it to me to serve and represent you. And I feel the same way about the White House. This is President Obama's the occupant, but it's all of ours. It's all of ours. It's part of our American heritage. So when I had the invitation to go and to be there at this signing, absolutely. And one little story about this, you don't really quite see it, you don't capture it here, but the President was sitting there at his desk and we're ready for it, and then he said, uh, I said, okay, let him in. I had never, 30 reporters came in. I had never seen anything like it. They burst in, they got this down to a science, and it was immediately like, uh, um, I guess, uh, the Academy Awards or something. I mean, just, just a flood of pictures and all these uh, microphones on extensions, you know, kind of being shoved. Uh, one almost hit him in the head. I was like, That's, don't do that. <laughs> so it was uh, just an amazing, intense moment. And then after it's all over, they run out the side. I, I just never seen anything like it. It's quite uh, quite intense. The president seemed very comfortable with it all. Okay, uh, Fort Monroe, very special place, and I'm so glad that we preserved it for generations to come. Um, the history here is just, it's uh, truly, truly unique. Um, and there's, a, of course, an overhead a photo of this, and, and there's not another facility like this, and the, the history, the moat, and uh, it was just a pleasure working with Mayor Ward and other city council and, and my colleagues. Uh, Congressman Scott was very instrumental. We worked together very closely on this, and you saw Senator Warner uh, helped out quite a bit as well. All right. Now, um, so the, that last slide was really local advocacy issues, just all the way from Chincoteague on the eastern shore. There's so much to talk about, but we'll, we'll be Hampton specific tonight. But reforming uh, Washington, really changing the institution, um, I'll be very direct with you. If what was taking place in Washington wasn't hurting all of us, regardless of party, set all that aside, I truly don't think I'd be serving. I mean, I sought the office because I thought, wait a minute, we're going off a cliff here. And I didn't see, you know, both parties are just locked down and hunkered down. And you know, that's not really where the American people are. We've all inherited a two-party system. and. Uh, you know, you got the hard D's over here and the, and the hard R's over here, and I don't think that's where the American, we're more of a continuum, uh, and we need to talk with one another. And so as I began uh, this whole, um, this journey of public service, the first thing I thought about truly, truly was, was what I learned at Paris Island when I was 18. Leadership by example. I guarantee it's the same for, for Colton as it was for me in 1978. There's not one thing that those drill instructors, those 25, 28, 20, maybe a 30-year-old staff sergeant drill instructor will ask you to do that he does not first do himself. He wants you to run through the mud, he runs through the mud. He wants you to do 20 pull-ups, he does 20 pull-ups. Leadership by example. So in every respect, I, I sought to lead by example and just do exactly what I thought needed to be done. 
you know, whether declining federal benefits, uh, self-imposed uh, lifetime ban on lobbying, this is wrong. It's wrong for members of Congress to stop work and then even a year later start lobbying their colleagues. We need a serve and go home mindset. People need to serve and go home. Like, And uh, my first bill was the Lead, Lead by Example Act, and it basically tied in, a, I think, an overly generous retirement benefit, like a 401k. It's the 403b program in Washington. But it's overly generous in my view, and I said, we're going to tie that into a reduction of the deficit. You just have to reduce the deficit by even a dollar from one year to the next, then you get your retirement benefit contribution for that year. Um, I have to tell you, it's a little tough getting folks to sign up for that. <laughs> Both parties, y'all. Both parties. Okay. Uh, now, and, and I'm going to close with this, these comments uh, because I know Barbara's about ready to lasso me here. And we're going to get on some questions. But this is, I think, very important. Um, I'm going to share three points with you and how I'm serving the second district. And these are, it wasn't something I sat down and tried to write out on a piece of paper, like writing out a speech or anything. I just found myself in conversations with the district saying these three things and being very deliberate about it. Um, and it's how I'm serving you and trying to, to bring a healing to our country. The first is this, is it's so important to me and to our staff that we bring a, a degree of civility back to the public square. Just to speak to one another and with one another, like our mothers taught us to, and our teachers taught us to. And you know, if you if you were really too rough with somebody in the classroom, if you had a good teacher, they no, not here. We're going to speak with one another with a degree of civility. We've really, I think, there's a coarseness that has taken over our public discourse. It's not good for our children. It's hurting us as Americans. And so every press release, my comments here tonight, I've noticed that's a practical uh, expression here. He's the President of the United States. He's President Obama. All right? The title is important. And you know, I just never used the term Obamacare. Because I thought, why? Right out of the get-go, it just starts to separate people. Now, I have differences on the Affordable Care Act, but they have nothing to do with the President personally. It's a policy difference. But I want to show respect to the office and respect to that to the gentleman who ran so hard and won the office. Civility is really important, and I try to bring that forward in our press releases and in our, our civil discussion. The second is this. The, the relentless pursuit and, and, and deep respect for the facts of the matter. What are the true facts? Not the talking points. What are the true facts? As a businessman, I can't make decisions off of my emotions or how I feel or a talking point. You really got to dig and get the facts. Sometimes that reinforces a long-held view. Sometimes you look at the facts and you go, uh-oh, uh that doesn't really reconcile with uh, what I've been saying. That's a moment of truth for someone in public office because you go, uh, I, I might have to make a course correction here based on the facts. So we've always tried to elevate the facts. It's not easy to get, and there's a lot of complex issues facing our country. But I've got a wonderful staff, and I'm so proud of them. And uh, between me digging into them and them digging into them, and really the wisdom of the district people walking up to me and talking to me, uh, we're always in pursuit of the facts. And in closing, and final point is this, is is just not questioning the motives of those with whom we disagree. You'll see if we walk through a question and answer period, um, and I'm not fixated on the president, but, but look, you can't help it, he's the president of the United States, so I'm going to reference him in another point here. The president and I have profound disagreements on some issues, many issues. Coastal energy, for example. Um, there's a lifetime, not a lifetime, excuse me, there is a full ban on, on exploration off the coast of Virginia. I strongly agree, I strongly disagree with his policy. He's made it clear through Secretary Salazar, no exploration off the coast of Virginia. Now, in my view, I see it as a ban on 
uh, of new jobs and opportunity. I see that as a as a ban on tax generation, much needed tax revenues. We need to we need more tax revenues for healthier children, healthier schools, and better roads. So the president and I disagree on this matter. But I don't question whether he wants to create jobs. I'm certain every day he wakes up and says, okay, how are we going to create jobs? It's normal. It's In fact, it's expected. The DNA of our country is spirited debate. I'm not saying we're all going to stand together and sing Kumbaya. We're going to have spirited debate on the House floor, maybe tonight here in this, this very auditorium. That's normal. 